I hate this shit. Like these, <laughs> these like these motherfuckers that that like come on and, and then they they use not only the credentials of being a professor, but they they end up like denigrating and like damaging academia to such an extent. People like Mershimer, for example, who does the same shit. This is the U.S. intelligence agency, Mind Control. So these people, I've found, this is literally Hezbollah news. What is this? It's, 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 I'm telling you. At Columbia it's, University. It's literally Hezbollah tirelessly news. tirelessly fights. This is nuts. Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik, and this is Dispatches. The West is aghast at the Russian invasion of Ukraine, as if this is the first war they ever experienced. Maybe because it's been so long since apparently civilized Europe was the victim of war. Though not as long as we might think. After all, Belgrade was bombed by NATO in 1999. Oh boy. And the Balkans, <laughs> of former Yugoslavia, ended in 1995. Everywhere in Europe, one can see the blue and yellow colors of Ukraine and an unprecedented solidarity. These are often sincere and laudable reactions. But one can't help but notice the double standards. Noam Chomsky famously oh spoke of worthy and unworthy victims. Today, Ukrainians are worthy victims, while all things Russian have been demonized and isolated in a manner unprecedented, perhaps since Germany was punished for its role in the First World War. But we're supposed to forget and My pretend. God. Let's forget that this punishment helps cause the Second World War. Let's pretend <laughs> the rampant racism this is stoked against Russians from the absurd Bro, to the dangerous. Is to <laughs> I told okay. you. I told you this is so good. Oh my god. Wait, so so Russia in this analogy is Germany. Great pick for the like for the fucking country you're defending and i'm so wait you need to roll this back like holy shit there was okay. so much i will i'll roll it back you must have oh, known you were so wrong when your fingers in the, in were dipped segments. inside me searching for honey that would not come for you spoke of worthy and unworthy victims today ukrainians are worthy victims while all things russian have been demonized and isolated in a manner unprecedented Perhaps since Germany was punished for its role in the First World War. Bro, I saw a Prager view that I was scouting the other day that I was just looking at because they're they're always gold too. It's literally the same <laughs> argument Prager U is making is that they they're literally like the reason why people like Palestine is because it's poor. Because if you're poor, you're worthy. And that's like that's the weird thing. That's the opposite of what argument these types are making. Yeah, it's is the, that it's it's the same thing. It's the unworthiness thing. Yeah, you know? but like it's in a in, it's in a, a backwards way because these types say, okay, the Ukrainians are rich and European and like white, and that's the reason why they're worthy victims. While Prager U will say that it's the poor Palestinians that are the worthy victims because the left values weakness. So mm -hmm. yes. It's, they just want to say that if they don't like the victims, they'll find a reason why the West likes the victims. Uh, and oh, if you could make an argument that, okay, like Russians and Russian culture is being like uh, demonized, but like, okay, yeah, well, they, they are, they started what like culture? a gigantic war. Uh, and it's not like anybody's gonna fucking genocide them like chill yeah i mean at, at the end of the day and this is why i always say to people um no criticism of ukraine is valid because if russia didn't invade none of this would be happening well yeah i i like i like to remind that to people who say oh you know the far right in ukraine and i said okay dude like okay if you if you if you uh if you care about the far right being weaker in ukraine why the fuck would you invade it like yeah times yeah. of invasion yeah, and that's like, the, are the times argument, of extreme nationalism. The argument against the nato expansion right his and yeah. if, if he was really afraid of nato expansion why would he invade and add two more members to nato 
And not just two you know? members, Finland. Yeah. Like, he <laughs> knew how these countries afraid. were going to react. Yeah, if he was afraid of NATO, why didn't he If he was just, afraid like, of NATO and he needed to stop with an invasion, he would have invaded Finland, not Ukraine. Yes. He would have yes. stopped in 2014 when he took over Crimea. Ever since Crimea was taken over, Ukraine would have never joined NATO. Just never. Like, the, there was a frozen conflict in Ukraine, just like Moldova. You, you can't join NATO when you're in a frozen conflict. Mm. So he clearly wasn't scared that Ukraine was going to join NATO. He just wanted Ukraine. <laughs> like it's. I it's mean, so not dumb. not only that, not only that, but Azov literally only exists because he sent neo Nazis from Russia into the Donbass, and <sighs> they said no. They said piss off, and then he sends in neo Nazis to stage a resistance basically which forms azov so all of this all tracks back to putin at the end of the day and if he just minded his own fucking business none of this would be happening well they'll say the same thing about why doesn't the u.s mind their business well i agree well, we're supposed to forget but that's where protect. i'm consistent and they're not let's forget that <laughs> yeah. the punishment helped cause the second world war let's pretend the rampant racism this is stoked against russians from the absurd to the dangerous, is totally okay. Should you say racism? Let's erase racism, the role yeah. NATO played in provoking this war. Let's erase all of the West's imperialist aggression, even as it continues today. Let's pretend Western values are superior, that they're all about freedom, despite censoring Russian media and branding anyone who questions the convenient mainstream narrative a Putin apologist. In fact, Let's forget about history and context and nuance. This is code. I, okay, we, are. Are. we are. We are. Yeah. We are forgetting this, about this history for watching you. I already am eating. <laughs> this, this is code. From the trash can all the time. You know, like, what, what, what bothers me is that, okay, like, it's, it's a, you know about, like, post-colonialism and, like, um, it's a very, very interesting topic of, of, uh, uh, like a, a very interesting theoretical background. Postcolonialists tend to be smarter than this, but like basically, postcolonialism does address like the grievance of countries that used to be like oppressed, poorer, uh, a against like uh, uh, like a, like the Western world, which only really very recently like stopped uh, with a lot of the shit that they that, that they accuse the. The third, the, like the the global south of 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 doing, you know, like th th that's that's the 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 narrative basically saying, okay, like fucking, uh, the Britain had like colonies until the fifties, like stuff like that. So there there is a lot of discussion saying, like, okay, dude, like you, like going back like 60, 70 years ago, you were the most brutal motherfuckers that ever existed, and suddenly like you are have mo you're morally superior. But that's the thing, right? If you agree that the shit like the Western countries did like 50, 60 years ago was morally reprehensible and you're doing the same shit now, okay, fine. You can you can call them hypocrites, but you're also a fucking criminal. So I don't care if the West is is horrible. I don't like the West. Fucking the, the, if you are horrible, you're horrible. Always talk about how liberals believe that it's like the final like, there will never be something beyond liberalism. They, like, they say this all the time and critiques of liberalism. I've never heard a liberal believe that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, what I what I do dislike about liberals a lot of the time is that, like, if you argue with them about how certain things are bad, their, their main argument is, okay, no, everything is fine right now, for the most yeah, part. Yeah, that's because they're NPCs. <laughs> I mean, it's the, it's, it's the, like the hegemonic like fucking political thought so of course it's like... it's public school education <laughs> okay so you would think with her hezbollah money she'd actually get a proper bookshelf for her books and reduce <laughs> the world to good and evil and to children's stories one man who won't let us do that is joseph masad professor of modern arab politics oh, and no. intellectual history at columbia university who tirelessly fights to remind the west of its hypocrisy and its history. Joseph, welcome. It's good to be here. Wait, I don't know this guy, right? Well, it's good to have you back, actually. Uh, it's been a while, and I'm very excited to have you to come discuss 
what's happening in the world right now. And I guess a good place to start would be, you know, like I mentioned, you are a professor of modern Arab politics and intellectual history, but you've written two recent articles for Middle East Eye, which I encourage everybody to check out. Uh, what do you think of Middle East Eye? I haven't heard of it, but that's the thing. I oh, okay. Heard of this guy. They're, pre they're pretty good. They're just, they, they like, um, you know, obviously you have to uh, read enough uh, different viewpoints, but like I've used them as sources. They're fine. The Excellent. thing is like um, these types of, of like media channels or propaganda channels, what they tend to do with academics is one of two things. Uh, well, two things. Basically, like they, they either take the academic, uh, ask them leading questions and try to boil down very quickly like a, a a nuanced like point that the academic might have spent like 20 or 30 pages in an article in an academic article trying to outline like a very interesting argument that if you if you read you could say okay i could see some of his points but instead what they do is like and there you have it the west is blah 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 like it's it's either that or they find the most fucking cook weirdos that like that they use as like a um, like an authority. You know how, for example, Russian bots like uh, say say more Hirsch mm -hmm. did X Y Z. We talk about him all the time on the show. Yeah. So the thing is, like, they will grab onto like four or five people who might have a title, might be kind of kind of known from some shit, and they say, "Did you see this guy said this thing?" It's like, well. Oh, Colonel it's what the Chinese Rickerson. do with just regular white people. <laughs> I'll tell you right now. I'll tell you right Scott now. Scott Ritter. Like, people like this that. This guy, okay. if he's a professor in Arab history, he knows damn well he's on Hezbollah TV. This is uh, focused on the war in Ukraine. So, very briefly, why did you shift your attention to this conflict? See, here you go. Also, that's another thing. It's like he's a professor of Arab history, but he's shifting his focus to Ukraine. Yeah. Why? Why do you have a why do you have a guy who's not an expert in the field coming on to talk about it? Um, first of all, I should say that I usually remind my readers, not the entire West, although I would like to have access to the entire West, to be able to remind them of this history. Um, in fact, I did not actually shift my focus at all. I mean, Russia and Ukraine uh, both have you know have relations and histories that are very much part of the history of the region which the West came to call the Middle East. Um, southern Ukraine, of course, uh, and the Crimea were former Ottoman regions that were conquered by the Tsars in the late 18th century and early 18th century. And Ukraine's separate colonial city of Odessa on the Black Sea, formerly, of course, the Ottoman city of Haji Bey, was the place where Greek anti-Muslim nationalism was born at the beginning of the 19th century and where colonial Jewish Zionism was born at the end of the 19th century. In Let fact, him cook. The first Let him cook. colonists who came to colonize Palestine in the 1880s were Ukrainian Jews <laughs> from the separate colony of Odessa. Of course, also the Crimea is another place that the Tsars uh, chose for Russian Jewish colonization in the late 18th century and throughout the 19th century, and would continue to be a destination for uh, Russian uh, Jews we that have the Jews. Tsars had dispatched. Uh, as colonists and uh, continued to do I so even under the Soviets it. in the 1920s, <laughs> who had partnered up with German um, Jewish American bankers uh, who uh, financed, it was a partnership where they financed um, Russian Jewish colonization of the Crimea in the 1920s and 30s. There were even plans to declare the Crimea an autonomous <laughs> Jewish Republic in the Soviet Union, but as <laughs> That was a history of Odessa and part of the history of Crimea. <laughs> that, that, was just, that was just why the Jews like did it, why the Jews are at fault. I believe that's what Hezbollah is going to make this angle. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's where it's going. It, yeah. it certainly sounds like it. It's, it's like what, what, the way he's lining them up, I was like, don't even pause. We don't need to debunk this. <laughs> we, we we find uh, Arab oh. history professor says, <laughs> talking about like Ukraine says the Jews are at fault. God damn it. Fuck. <laughs> Why, dude? As a result of the indigenous Tartar, Crimean Tartar uh, opposition, uh, the project was shifted to Birobidzhan by Stalin in uh, the middle of the 1930s. Um, 
At present, of course, both countries, Ukraine and Russia, have policies that are entangled with the Middle East. Um, uh, perhaps I should remind uh, uh, our audience that Ukraine uh, dispatched that was their leg, the third largest military contingent uh, to invade and occupy Iraq in 2003. And uh, its occupation troops, upwards of 5,000, I think, remained in, the, uh, in Iraq until 2008. Okay. Also, of course, Ukraine officially has been a big supporter of Israel and its invasion and occupation of Gaza and other Palestinian and Syrian lands. As far as Russia is concerned, of course, Putin has also had excellent relations with Israel, but at the same time, he did intervene in Syria against the regime's uh, jihadist uh, and, and American and Gulf-supported enemies. However, his intervention in Syria She's continued back. to allow the Israelis to bomb Syria, but not the jihadists. She, her camera is um, lower of quality. There's also the issue of Ukrainian of Jews today, which Israel is calling upon. Um, to immigrate, quote unquote, immigrate to Israel so that they can goes. transform them into colonists of the land of the Palestinians. So as you can see, there's a, you know, a long history and present entanglement uh, in our region uh, by both Russia and the Ukraine. We figured out why he's on here. The US and Europe. The link well, that, all right, there oh. we go. That was his, that is, is, that's why he's covering Russia. That was that's what it says. That topic area was why he's covering Russia and Ukraine. Apparently, because of the Jews. Did so you the, did you just hear what she said? She said, we have "Well Jews. said," is what she she came back with. Wow! Nice incredible. work. Nice work with your journalisming, you dickhead. She's not a journalist. <laughs> oh, I know. That's she my tries, point. <laughs> he tries to lay out this fucking link between Ukraine and like the like middle east and israel he has to go back to like the ottoman times first of all second of all like okay like the links he lays out is like okay like fucking uh jews financed some like immigration to crimea like okay fucking who cares like <laughs> it's like how, how do you connect this to like modern israel like oh ukraine is a big supporter of israel like how how so like but Greece is apparently a big supporter of Israel because we care to be friendly enough with them to be to have like uh, to have them as a front against Turkey or for drilling rights. This doesn't mean anything. It, it's it's. Oh God. Do you, you control do you teach Arab history? No, I don't think so. <laughs> That's the thing. But like, if you if you speak from like a place of of authority, if you know some history, like you could draw a link from anything to anything. I could draw like a, a fucking link between like I don't know maybe let, let's say like Greek uh, immigration uh, to uh, and and diaspora to say like Biden. If I tried hard enough, I'd find the link. Like it's not that difficult. So you have lived in the U.S. for decades, and you wrote about this. You've experienced this kind of like American war fervor in the past when it came to. Other places, such as the former Yugoslavia, oh, Panama, boy. Granada, and then there's the post-9-11, global killing spree, uh, the war on Iraq. So how do you see this current like crusade against Russia in this context? Yeah, she slips adjectives the in there, like crusade. Attention? This is why, this is why I mean, we're I, against listen, adjectives. I arrived in the U.S. Uh, you know, in 1982 to go to college. This was sort of amidst the... Uh, but also, uh, in addition, of course, there was the idea of uh, the, the right wing at the time insisting that the U.S. should stop shipment of American wheat that it sold to the Soviet Union at the time. Um, I remember at rallies or at uh, events where American officials spoke, right wing Republicans would yell at them saying, starve Russia or starve the Soviet Union. I mean, I was 18 or 19 and it was shocking to witness uh, a genocidal wishes to starve uh, people. Um, but of course, uh, uh, the major history of genocide through here began, of course, in uh, uh, the latter part also of the 1980s uh, with Reagan's uh, attack on Libya. Um, oh, and at the time the Jack, I was telling you about this literally yesterday where, where Reagan bombed Gaddafi and he framed it like it killed his daughter. Yeah. Oh, my God. That dude, that is such a deep cut. I I did not think I'd hear anyone ever bring that one up. <laughs> Alleged Arab uh, 
terrorists uh, in the U.S. plans for internment camps for Arabs uh, by, you know, uh, after 9-11, uh, that was transformed into Muslims more generally. Uh, so we begin to see a much larger hysteria. So, um, uh, of course, so in addition, you know, on a smaller scale, I remember witnessing in the 1980s when I came to the U.S., the anti-Japanese hysteria. This is at a time when Japanese investment in... Now, let's keep in mind that Jap Japan said that it was America's fault that a girl was, like, tortured to death and put in a concrete barrel and disposed of, you know? Like, Japanese blamed all their bad crime on America at the time. They said it was America disease, yeah, right? That's, it's the, that's the, like, the, the, the fucking fucked up thing is that, like, you can do the... Uh, you can you can you can do all this shit and draw like strenuous links all you want, but in the end you end up sounding like this, like fucking lost in the sauce. Can't make a single tight argument. Has to fucking dude. Talk imagine for hours. taking this guy's class and just trying to oh. absorb something, trying to absorb a lecture. In the U.S., in terms of businesses, was uh, a lot less than German or British foreign investment. Yet, of course, because the Germans and the British were considered white, the oh, uh, boy. threat was perceived to be Japanese investment, uh, and you know, you know, people were killed for looking Japanese or for being mistaken for being Japanese. Uh, members, Republican members of Congress, would bring sledgehammers and destroy T Toshiba electronic products in front of the Capitol. This is during the Reagan. Year. And today we're shooting Bud Light with with machine guns. Oh no, they. They, 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 are you telling me that the Republicans got crazy, bought products, and then smashed them? Incredible. Basically, you can see the genocidal intent against yeah. shit here. Uh, by the way, I, remember what I said? I could draw a link between fucking Greek immigration and Biden? Well, turns out Bidenopoulos was real, so fuck. At some point, Joe Biden had, had that, like, done a, like, a kind of meme where he said that, like, uh, he like that people gave him the nickname Joe Bidenopoulos. He, it was some kind of fucking talk about like the Greek, uh, with the Greek like uh, expats and like fucking emigres. Like Bidenopoulos is just taking Biden and adding like a Greek ending. Yeah, to yeah, yeah. So, so like a Greek reporter is like some fucking online mag magazine, and they said so. Okay, like we found a historian who said that a guy was called Bidenopoulos in like uh in a list of like revolutionary fighters basically which is really funny because they must have changed the name at least a little bit because biden not a very greek name like yeah, he's, he also, must have... he's also irish yes <laughs> also that like it's so <laughs> fucking weird like it's deeply weird and it's not like yeah. biden is like so, uh... very young you know mm -hmm. because like his granddad is pro would probably be a fucking alive for the revolu for the Greek Revolution. So how far, how far back do you have to draw? Do you think you know? So uh, uh, this this the section after this one looks where it's going to really get into the meat of where it's going to drive us crazy. You know, there was some uh, uh, interesting sort of horror that I did witness uh, here when when I first arrived in the U.S. Uh, uh, a, a week or so after my arrival, I remember walking on campus just to uh, explore uh, campus. This is in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And suddenly a car full of white fraternity boys began to harass me, calling me Iranian and Persian. And I wasn't sure what this was about. It took me sort of a, a second to understand what was going on. Um, so, um, yes, it was a very strange uh, uh, culture shock, I must say, to come into this kind of a... Uh, uh, mob mentality uh, during these kinds of mobilization of anti some country hysteria or anti some population hysteria usually generated by the American political class and the corporate media. So um, uh, I had not witnessed anything like it growing up in Jordan, of course. Ah, oh, fuck! That's incredible. <laughs> fuck! Okay, he so he was being stereotyped incorrect. by the college kids because a bunch yeah. of Iranians had just immigrated. Fuck, man! <laughs> oh, oh my god. So, and, and like a, a very basic thing, like, 
be, being targeted by anti like by weird american propaganda or whatever doesn't make you necessarily it, it was also good. it was also a bunch of drunk white fraternity boys yelling yeah. at him you, you know like that's the thing like a lot of people bring up the the argument that like oh american hysteria about xyz painted xy group as bad you know like okay yeah sure they could have painted them bad in incorrect ways they could have been wrong about some of it but that like automatically being targeted against uh, by american propaganda doesn't automatically make you good it doesn't make you it, it, it doesn't make automatically like the fucking americans wrong about like your assessment a lot of the time they're wrong on the specifics details a lot of the a lot of the time they wildly exaggerate or stereotype culturally however sometimes you know they they, they have good reasons why they might dislike you and sometimes uh you are like they've missed ways that you you were terrible like that, that's a, that's a funny thing like being targeted by american propaganda doesn't say much you could be like a good guy you could be a piece of shit it's not very accurate so why would you use it as like a a, a thing like a badge of honor it's not a good if you th if you agree that it isn't accurate then it's probably going to be inaccurate in multiple ways compliment maybe to be considered persian not by my white fraternity boys but <laughs> that's okay hezbollah <laughs> that's actually pretty scary that's yeah, but I mean, I mean, I, I, I got to feel what many Iranians must have felt when you've been in this country after '79 and '80. I came only in '80. Okay, I'm saying this didn't happen at all. They're just appealing to their fan base. That's People what who I, like that's, the IRGC. Yeah, me too. And this was just sort of some harassment and taunting, sort of in the car going back and forth. And I didn't know what they were doing or what that was about. Uh, so it really uh, sounded like I, it, and I, then I, I they all clapped. Sorry, having gone through this uh, very, you know, uh, the Yomi uh, Park, uh, and, then the the kid, the and then the rat ate the kid, and then the kid eat the rat, and then the grandma ate the kids. I wasn't sure if they were going to disembark, and, uh, uh, beat me up or something. Right. Uh, but I can, you know, but I can okay, imagine dude. that must have happened to uh, uh, many Iranians or those mistaken for them on American streets during that period. So I want to, I do want to get back to some of the Russophobia that we're seeing right now, because some of it's so ridiculous, but it's also really frightening. That's not a word. But I, I, you know, on, on Breakthrough News and a lot of the programming we've had on Breakthrough News, we've, we've made a point to, every time we talk about what's happening in Ukraine, to discuss the context of how we got here, because it's so often obviously missing mm, it, from yeah, the Putin, entire yes. mainstream narrative on this. And since Russia invaded Ukraine, what we've seen is this attempt to really pathologize Vladimir Putin as some like crazy madman, which isn't new. He I is mean, insane. we see with every U.S. adversary, the leader of whatever country they're at war with or they want to go to war with is um, portrayed as a madman who's comparable to him. Can we just replace Matt Taibbi with her? Because I think it would just be better for everyone. Like, yeah, uh, you know, like that's the, that's the thing. That's exactly what I was saying, right? Like exactly. Like, oh, targeted by by U.S. propaganda. It's like, okay, yeah, you could be targeted against U.S. propaganda and be any type of person. Mm -hmm. It's it's not a Hitler. There's like the Hitler comparison uh, starts to come into play, and of course, the point of doing this Was is it? to strip away. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say quickly. Um, the comparison of Hitler to Putin is incorrect. The correct comparison of Hitler is Xi Jinping. Continue. <laughs> um, I was going to say that they also have another video uh, that, where they just deny the Tigray genocide happening and saying that it's all American oh propaganda. It, because she mentioned Russophobia. It's like, I find it annoying when like some fucking Twitter trolls are saying that like, oh yeah, it's like an essentialist thing, you know, like, like that, that, that the Russians are basically like genetically predisposed to being like submissive like to to their masters or genetically predisposed to not, to be authoritarian that shit bothers me but at the same time i'm not i'm not like deluded into thinking that like that somehow justifies the invasion of ukraine or that just like that that somehow like made it oh it makes so much sense dude that putin is going into ukraine it's because people were fucking racist towards russians no it fucking isn't that okay um 
Can you name me a war where the people if the people started the war because the other side was really racist and mean to them? <laughs> the Take a minute, see if you can. We got here, which oftentimes involves policies of the U.S. and its allies. So you actually you wrote a piece about this. The title is Russia Ukraine War: How the West Backed Putin into a Corner. So I'm wondering if you can briefly offer us your analysis of why and how this happened. I should begin, of course, by saying that um, it is also this service to the struggle against Nazism and Hitler mm. to claim that Hitler was also a madman. Hitler was a, you know, a calculating, uh, rational, uh, genocidal, uh, 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 criminal sort of uh, ruler, and not mad in that sense any more than. Uh, American presidents who have uh, uh, also planned genocidal bombings around the world since World War II have been mad. So the idea of this, this investment in mental sanity, rather than acknowledge that their adversaries are as smart as they, that their adversaries have issues which the West may not see as legitimate, but uh, you know it would be logical for their adversaries to see as uh, 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 rational. They uh, in, I mean, so, so there's a lack of honesty constantly in the insistence that anyone who opposes uh, uh, U.S. or West European policy must be irrational and mad. At any rate, no. Of course, uh, what I um, that there's a um, remember like when they went up to um, literally everyone in our government. At and they said, hey, what do you think about China going in and doing normal relations with Iran and Saudi Arabia? And literally everyone in the American government said, as long as it brings peace to the area, I hope it's a, I hope it's a good thing. Uh, Remember that when that happened like three weeks ago? I don't know. Like it, it, almost the entire definition of everything just revolves around what the American framing is and how you can like how to be against it. Mm -hmm. It's like. Okay, yeah, the Americans tend to like paint people as madmen, but fucking so does everyone else. Like, have you seen the way like state propaganda from other countries portrays whoever their enemy is? I mean, fucking Greece does it to Turkey, like uh, Turkey does it to us. I'm pretty sure Iran doesn't have very good propaganda towards the US, doesn't say, okay, they, they are our rational opponents to, to whom we extend. No, they're fucking. It weirdo infidels like who, who seek to destroy you like that's china how, is a good example yeah, Again. yeah how china talks about the u.s but like that's the thing like this charitability is supposed to be afforded by like afforded by western countries but it's not necessarily this standard is not like universally enforced you have you have a bone to pick against western countries so you're going to use this against them but fucking everyone does it um, there's always, I always remember the joke when Gorbachev had a summit with uh, President Reagan um, uh, in the mid 1980s. And Reagan, not terribly, American history, let alone Soviet history, <laughs> turns to Gorbachev and tells him, But you know, I'm very happy that our countries had never gone to war. Only for Gorbachev to look at him and say, What? You invaded us after the revolution. But uh, so uh, be that as it may, of course, uh, uh, even after the, 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 the uh, or with, with during uh, these invasions. Uh, and so he's saying that uh, the West is hypocritical for calling out Russia for invading Ukraine because the West invaded Russia before. In Why not just use the Iraq war if you're going to do this example? Jesus. The ongoing civil war between the Tsarist armies. Also, Poland, which had just become independent with the support of Soviet Russia, its new nationalist uh, uh, leaders, General Kulsutsky, insisted what? on expanding the territory. Of the <laughs> what? Poland. Wait, what? I'm sorry. He, he, wait, we're wrong here already. He did. Poland didn't become independent because of the help of Soviet Russia. Poland became independent because of the agreements with fucking Trotsky and like the how the the line was ended, how the First World War ended. Like there was chaos in the East after 1917 to 18. Uh, it was supposed to be German held territory, but Germany collapsed, and so and so had Russia. Oh my God, I, I keep forgetting the fucking agreements. What the? Uh, oh, I can't Google it now. Anyway, but like. Poland became 
like free and nationalist almost incidentally. It was because fucking the the Germans collapsed and the Soviets were dealing like they had their own fucking internal turmoil. They weren't in control of the country. The whites were like fighting them from the yeah, east. Yeah, there is the whole Soviet civil war. That's that's the thing. It's just like, what does this have to do with Ukraine today? Yeah. The, the Soviets didn't help Poland exist. In fact, they didn't really want a nationalist Poland. They, they didn't this want, guy they is more unhinged than that other guy who, like, you know, like who the everyone Polish tells. Soviet war happened in 1920. Will he blame that on, like, will he say that, like, basically, like, Poland backstabbed the Soviet Union during the Polish Soviet war? Is that, like, the angle we're taking this at? This dude is a professor. A that's a, that bo that's what bothers me. Half or more decided to invade Soviet Russia to acquire more territories. And indeed, um, at the end, while at, at the beginning, they were uh, uh, held back uh, with French help and the British, they ultimately prevailed and the Soviets uh, were uh, sort of forced to sign uh, uh, a treaty uh, conceding a lot of their territory, including Western Ukraine and Russia, uh, uh, to uh, Poland. Not um, this of treaty, course, uh, the big issue uh, the uh, in terms of memory and almost living memory for uh, Russian citizens today is the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union. Living memory today Here we go. is the Nazi invasion. Living memory. Living memory, yeah. Okay, living. sure. People in the, some people in their nineties remember the the Battle of Stalingrad. Nobody veterans are still living. Yeah, nineties in Russia. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but remember, uh, uh, usually the West forgets, and often you hear a lot of cold warriors constantly repeating. Uh, the the Nazis. Mark, uh, it was Stalin who had signed the non-aggression pact with Hitler um, in August. No, we don't hear this because nobody fucking talks about it. Between 1933 and 1939, Western Europe, especially the British, were very much cultivating relations with Nazi Germany in the hope of actually having uh, an alliance against the Soviet Union. At the time, the Nazis had already signed uh, the so-called anti-communist uh, international See how good she treaty is at to with be Japan though. and Italy and Hungary, um, among others, in order to encircle the Soviet Union from the, the east and the west. But the British, of course, had already uh, signed the 1935 Anglo-German Naval Agreement uh, with, uh, uh, of course, the Nazis, which was followed in 1936 um, by the British acquiescence. What was the naval agreement? Of the what was it? Which was Tell me. What was the naval agreement? What was the goal of the naval agreement? The 1935 naval agreement. Uh, I bet he doesn't fucking know. It's just say it loud and clear. They'll blow up that dam. I'm pretty sure. If, Trump, if Trump thinks it's to blow up a dam. If I remember correctly, the 1935 naval agreement wasn't collaboration between Nazi Germany and Britain. It was to limit the level the amount of carriers sorry not the amount of carriers the amount the, the, the size of ships that could be built the naval agreements happened between france japan the us basically the major fleet having nations and the reason why these agreements happened was in order to you know reduce armaments between opponents it was it, it's like salt. it's like comparing it's like salt okay it's like comparing like the strategic nuclear like yeah, you know salt. Not. Yeah, exactly. It's like it's like comparing that to the Nazi uh, pact, like the the Soviet non-aggression pact with Nazi Germany, uh, the the Molotov-Ribbentrop pact. Completely different things. Completely different goals. Like fucking, you want you want to fu to to shoot like you you want to shoot a shot at like uh, Western appeasement. Look at like just say talk about like the Munich Agreement. Like saying, okay, Mr. Hitler, you can have a piece of Czechoslovakia, but not all of it, dude. It's fine. <laughs> and then we can have peace, right? And Hitler says, right, right. <laughs> but you know what bothers me with types like this? Like being being lost in the sauce. Like you can make like academics can be really good if the, if you if you put them in their element, which is writing articles that have to be like not only tightly written. But also they have to have proper argumentation. You can because like with with articles you can go back and forth, okay, forever. But you can also like take the arguments point by point. But when you take somebody like this, who 
let's be real, like has probably like studied and read like a billion things. And you try to get him in this format to like, to form an argument, he won't manage to do it. He's thinking about a billion things, clearly, because she's talked about a billion things. Uh, he ha- So he, instead of like admitting that, you know, he just like feels that it's kind of annoying and hypocritical of the US to call out Russia for the invasion of Ukraine. Instead of making that point, he knows he's an academic. He knows he knows a billion things. So what he does is he goes over the billion things he knows that are vaguely or not yeah, at all Yeah, and he never gets up to the current times, yes. you know? He, like, so, he gets like, lost. He, he talks about basically every grievance that Russia could possibly have towards the, towards the U.S. as if that's connected to Ukraine. Like, it's, it's so fucked. It's so weird. And it's so annoying that, like... People be, people end up believing that this is what professors are like, but this is how, what like fucking well known ones are like because because proper professors don't fucking do this shit. You know, they don't go out in the media like constantly talking. They write articles and they fuck off to to their students. You know, that's what they that's what like my professors wouldn't do this shit. Fucking, I have like I have an Iranian professor who I like gr- greatly admire. And I know she wouldn't do this shit. <laughs> like, I, I know she would never fucking go on, like, uh, like, a, a, a talk TV? like this. Yeah, she wouldn't do that shit. I hate this shit. Like, these, <laughs> these like, these motherfuckers that, that like, ca- come on and, and then they, they use not only the credentials of being a professor, but they, they end up, like, denigrating and, like, damaging academia to such an extent. People like Mershimer, for example, who does the same shit. Mersheimer, like you, they are part of the things you read for international relations. You end up, you, you, you might have to read Mersheimer when he describes his theories of like, uh, of the neorealist theories. But the thing is, like, when you go and do this shit, you're not being a professor. You're being a guy with a grievance that uses the knowledge you have as a professor to make things co- more complicated than they have to be. Like, just say you have a grievance. Like, fucking... Just say that. The name of the section is Why Did Russia Invade Ukraine? Historical Context. Yeah, like, it, it makes connection no connection treaty. almost. So by the time they signed, the British signed the Munich Agreement um, uh, in uh, September 1938, uh, along with uh, France uh, and Italy, they did they did that behind uh, uh, the Soviet Union, who in fact had wanted uh, or was in fact had a non-aggression treaty and mutual defense treaty with Czechoslovakia. The Munich Agreement, of course, facilitated uh, the Nazi invasion and occupation of the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia. Uh, the French refused uh, to help uh, militarily, and the Soviets were kept out of the picture in this very important Western alliance against the Soviet Union. Um, so as a result of this, you know, an ongoing relations, by July 1939, in fact, uh, uh, British Prime Minister Chamberlain's permanent undersecretary of the Treasury at the time, Sir Horace Wilson, proposed to Hitler an Anglo-German defensive alliance for 25 years and that Germany's former colonies in Africa would be returned to her by, you know, stages. I, I quote uh, uh, from the proposal, amongst other sort of economic goodies that the British were promising Germany, if Germany at the time were to when okay, let let's just think when about this like we normal people. When have we ever thought about something and we said, you know what, yeah, you know that nation deserves it because of what they did a hundred years ago? Okay, th- to be fair, that's like ninety percent of the thinking that goes on in Greece and Turkey. <laughs> I can think of examples, fucking... People still discuss the fucking... uh, Literally, just a hundred years ago, was the Treaty of Lausanne. It's, like, in the discussion, like, constantly, so... These next, like, what is, like... Okay, it's it's two minutes, and it's the... And then after that, it's, like, when the the video starts dropping off. Take, you know, no action in Europe, and especially in Poland. At the time, the Germans were open. Hitler found the offer uh, interesting and proceeded to talk to them uh, uh, in August 1939. This is the month 
when Stalin decided to, to sign the non-aggression pact, when he realized that Bro, unless I, I, I clicked, the I clicked sort by most popular, and this was like union, top eight um, the German most popular videos from this Britain channel. Other European countries he, might he's talking about the thing. fucking so, um, the Ribbentrop Pact. Of course, the invasion did come through. Um, and as a result of the uh, wait, 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 uh, did he mention Poland, the Axis Soviet uh, talks? Uh, huh? Did he mention the, the, the Axis Soviet talks? I don't know, bro. I feel I don't like... think so because people always bring up the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, but there are, there's even worse there's the Axis Soviet talks. So, so the, 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 the basically was like discussions for the Soviet Union to actually formally join the Axis and like properly divide Eastern Europe. Like, that's the thing, like, people debate whether or not Stalin thought that, like, uh, that, that like, war with Hitler would, would come eventually. And he did. He did think that war with Hitler would come, but he didn't think it would come this quick. He thought that there would be, like, kind of like a cold war where the Soviet Union would have time. And he actually believed that so much, he thought that, that like, he was playing Hitler, basically, during the, during the, um the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. He thought he was, like, kind of playing Hitler and, 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 like, he was gonna be able to, like, strike when he wanted. That when he was, like, when the British kept telling him, hey, dude, like, there's fucking, there's, like, a million, there's, like, three million German soldiers on your border. Maybe you should react. Stanley was, like, ass bullshit. Like, his generals was were telling him, he was, like, bullshit, bullshit, I call. And then, like, he, like, even, like, a week into Barbarossa, like, Stalin had kind of lost his shit. He couldn't even believe it was happening. He thought it was a mistake during the first days. The Germans are attacking everything. Their panzers have penetrated our lines. Their air force dominates. We've lost almost a thousand aircraft. A thousand? How can that be? Most were destroyed on the ground. On the ground? Despite warnings and recommendations, they were left in forward positions. No, counterattack here, 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 and here. You don't understand the situation. Our front is crumbling. Our forces are retreating, trying to avoid capture. No capture, no retreat, no surrender. Attack. Beria, Beria. Bring up security troops. Should anyone trying to retreat? Shoot our own men? Yes, and we'll shoot you too, you incompetent fool! Cuba! How can you say that? Who killed off all our best generals? 40,000 of our best officers called them enemies of the people, had them shot! Who trusted Hitler? Who said he would not attack us? Voroshilov? No, it was you. It was you! That's because Stalin was such an egomaniac that he didn't yeah. believe it you know, would happen. What's, what's funny is he I was so confident on, in his own actions. I didn't actions. history because I didn't want to do World War II. Yet here we are because of this guy right here. Man, uh, Stalin fucking... decided to uh, invade Eastern Poland and, uh, uh, in many ways, uh, uh, annex uh, you know all the former Soviet territories that were invaded and occupied by the Poles back in 1920 and 1921. Uh, so, the truck constantly uh, beeping so up this in the was background sort of the context, is my favorite part. Uh, after which, of course, uh, unannounced, the Germans would uh, invade the Soviet Union um, and go on a sort of rampage, destroying the country, killing upwards of 26 million people um, until the Soviets uh, were able to rebuff that invasion and win the war for the world. After all, 90% of Nazi casualties. Uh, ding, 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 ding. So there it is. Americans did not enter the war. Fucking so most common it, tanky uh, talking point I've ever heard. In fact, early 1942, after the Pearl Harbor, um, you know, the Americans, of course, did lose about 450,000 soldiers, but compared to 26 million people in a destroyed country, um, uh, the trauma of the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union remains a living trauma for those who had uh, yeah. uh, now become uh, Russians. There is uh, a... So in that sense, um, Hang there on. is that history on, of see. encirclement. In the last of course, to get uh, one more minute. Years, the West and NATO had continued to expand eastwards to encircle uh, Russia. Um, they included in the European Union most of uh, the formerly socialist uh, Eastern European countries, and uh, as well as in NATO, including former Soviet Republic, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, 
and had been hoping to bring in uh, Ukraine to finally uh, close the circle around uh, Russia. How does that? Uh, the Europeans. How is that encircling? First of all, how is that encircling? <laughs> Second of all, okay, so what if they encircle it? They can't invade it. It's a nuclear power. It's not like Hitler. It's it's not like that. And third of all, don't the fucking former Soviet republics have their own autonomy? Don't they have their own freedom of action? Can't they choose to join the West? Not when Ukraine has a, a gas... Uh, reserve and natural resource reserve lying under it that could Fuck. challenge the Russian gas monopoly. Of course Please. not. You can't let that happen. Imagine yeah, if that's... Europe got a hold of Ukraine's gas uh, reserves. Imagine oh. if Crimea goes back to Ukraine and they they lose all that shale gas off Crimea's western coast. That'd like, be it's... devastating for Russia. That's why they're in there, most likely. <laughs> These people talk about like colonialism so often, right? so often about the self-determination of peoples and then when it comes to the self-determination of fucking eastern europeans suddenly all that goes out the window they're all satellites of russia what the fuck i'm sorry like and, and even like the constant justification of oh nato's getting closer nato's getting closer nato's doing that so what if russia had balls right they would say we don't care that nato's getting closer because we don't have any territorial ambitions because we aren't in the fucking 20th century, are we? Exactly. That's such a it's such a good point. Or, like if, if there or was no Russia expansionary could just be thinking, nice and then yeah. actually like honor packs and stuff and people would want to make agreements with them. Yeah, and, and at like, the end of the day, if Russia just stopped being so an hard. asshole. The like, Europeans Russia tried just... so hard. Look at Angela Merkel. Yeah, fucking 20 years of that shit. Overlooking Georgia, overlooking so much shit. Genocides were ignored. Man, it, it bothers me so much. So uh, much. Uh, with uh, NATO armaments and a NATO alliance. Oh, also... Um, so this uh, is the background. Because because he mentioned, oh, like the Americans lost 450,000, the Soviets lost 26 million, that's incomparable. Okay, you know, like Greece <laughs> lost more, more people than, than the US. That doesn't mean that Greece was more important to the victory against the I was going to say... You can't you can't use human wave tactics and then cry that the other side killed too many of your guys. I mean, to, it, the, the, the Soviets did like the bulk of the of the fighting, but like World War II is a truly collective effort mm -hmm. against the Nazis. And trying to like say, oh, one country won the war. That's just not the case. And also, not it's ignoring that the U.S. was fighting two two fronts. Yes, it's ignoring the fact that the U.S. and Britain lend leased the Soviet Union heavily. They coordinated together, like the Soviets, the the uh, Americans, and the British. They worked together to 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 defeat the Nazis. Uh, multiple fronts were tied down by the Western allies. Uh, like shipping, raw materials were sent to like. Sure, like you could make arguments all day long. Well, I, I was really hoping. On their own? Like, I was really hoping what he was going to end with here was that he was going to justify the invasion because the Russians are triggered by the swastikas in Azov Battalion because oh, the living think? memory of the Nazi invasion. Oh, per, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe. Uh, like, oh, that one I really like as well. You know, the Ukraine's like the the Ukraine like collaborated with the Nazis. Fucking everyone did. Yeah. Russia collaborated with the Nazis. And not only that, my counter-argument to that is like, okay, dude, Mr. Tanky, let's say, let's compare how many Ukrainians collaborated with the Nazis with how many Ukrainians fought for the Red Army. So, like 200,000 Ukrainians collaborated with the Nazis, maybe 300,000 in their, in their armies, and 5 million Ukrainians fought for the Red Army. Are those people less Ukrainian? I'm sorry, like, the Soviets made distinctions. They knew who was fighting from where. It wasn't, like, a, a completely homogenous country. They knew, the Soviets knew how many Kazakhs fought the Nazis, knew how many people from, like, other minority regions, and they knew, like, the, the Soviets considered the Ukrainians some of their most reliable troops. The reason for that is fucking Ukraine was occupied completely by the Nazis. Of course you're gonna find 200,000 collaborators. Like, Fuck, you, you could find as many like in Russian, uh, like the ROA, the Russian Liberation Army, however it was called. Like, that's not an argument, my dude. It's also, it also has nothing to do with today. Yeah, 
Of course, because uh, you end up uh, getting is, tied uh, down and arguing response, about this shit. Uh, military response, uh, regrettable as that may be. Right. And it is interesting that it's this kind of obviously not exact repeat, but what do they say that history doesn't repeat, but it echoes or something? Rhymes. I don't know. I'm like ruining the quote. Uh, but it either it rhymes twice, the first time as tragedy, the second time. Well, there you go. There's Marx. Right. And so well, in this I, case. I, interestingly, Marx always said that. They're uh, actually playing into the next thing I was going to do. Although Marx did not They're tell us where it up. came from. And no one since Marx Talking about history this, repeating has been itself. able to find a quote from That's going to be the theme for said, today. So actually <laughs> Marx invented the quote. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll give it to Marx. But it's. Okay. Sure you will. I'm in pain. That's the thing. Okay, like, let's move on from this. This was. Yeah, no, no, we're done. Misery. We're done here.